I might be at risk of disappearing into my couch and becoming a floating head in this shirt and couch combination, but to be real with you guys, I've got two more videos to film after this and I can't make more than three outfit decisions in a day. Hi everyone, Rosie here. Welcome or welcome back to my channel. You guys know the drill, it's a new month. Let's talk about my reading last month. In this case, of course, it's February, so we're gonna do my January wrap up. If any of the reviews slash wrap up stuff in this video is incredibly incomplete or incoherent, blame my past self because I was really lazy this month and I didn't write up my reviews as I read. I waited until yesterday and did it all at once. So like, I don't remember a lot of stuff and I'm just going on my reading notes, which are so unhelpful. Some of the books I talked about today are on my January TBR slash my Bookworms New Year Readathon TBR, which will be up here in case you're interested, but you know what books are going to be on it because they're in this video, so don't blame me if you don't want to check that one out. And then there's also some just like books that I happened to pick up this month that I don't know if were mentioned in that TBR. The first book I read in January was on my TBR and it is The Name of the Rose by Umberto Eco. I read this for the prompt of read a book that intimidates you because I had previously tried to read this and failed. This is a mystery novel set in a monastery in the 1300s in Italy, if I'm remembering correctly, and the entire book is framed as a modern author translating a manuscript that's an account of a true story, if that makes sense. And it was so well done that I actually had to like go google it and be like, wait, this this feels like it could be real. Is this based on a real thing? It's not. It's totally just a novel, but like that framing was super cool. As I said, this takes place in a monastery. There's a group of monks who have gathered for like a big debate on heresy type thing, and a series of bodies start turning up murdered in strange, disturbing ways that seem to be vaguely biblical, I think. And one of the monks who's sort of like a diplomat but also very much sort of, I'm a 14th century monk, but also I'm an enlightened 14th century monk who uses logic, is trying to solve the crimes and figure out what happened. And our narrator is a young man who's a novice, I think? I don't think he's a full monk yet. And he's basically working as this senior monk's assistant, kind of, and sort of following him around and learning from him and helping out a bit. And messing things up a bit. The manuscript is presented as if he is a now an old man, sort of you know 60 years after the events of the story or something, writing down what happened to him. I actually really appreciated this narrative style though because for all that the writing in this was very very different to most mysteries I read and the sort of style and the way things were done, very different to most of the mysteries I read. Having that Watson-like character do the narration and having the closed setting of this monastery where there's very few people coming in and out gave it a bit of familiarity that kind of helped. On a second reading I understand why I DNF'd it the first time, but I also think I stopped just before I would have gotten really into it. I thought at the beginning it was very very mixed. Half of the pages were incredible, amazing writing, super gripping, so like I want to read more of this. And then you'd get sort of interspersed throughout them the other half of the pages which were sort of just like page long sentences describing religious fever dreams or something that were just like a page of run on descriptive sentence and I didn't enjoy those. I sort of appreciated what they brought to the book I guess but I didn't enjoy reading them and thankfully there were less of those throughout the book or possibly I got more used to the style and the tone and reading that. I'm not sure I think there were less of them in the later parts of the book once the mystery really gets going. I wasn't particularly interested in the extensive debate of 14th century religious doctrine, but I mean I guess that's an essential part of the book and like part of what's being done, so I can't complain too much. It just wasn't something that was interesting to me. I was far more interested in the mystery side of it, but I think there's a lot of stuff that maybe if I understood religion better I would have more of an insight to how it's all related. I'm not sure. Overall though, I really enjoyed this book. It pulled me in way more than I expected it to. I didn't find it that hard to read other than those certain pages where you just sort of glazed over, but on the whole it was pretty readable. I don't know why I was so scared of it and it was a really fun time and I really enjoyed the mystery element. I am a 
apparently incapable of speech today because you've probably just seen me talk about the name of the rose for one, maybe two minutes max, and it's taken me 12 minutes to film. Let's hope I can pick up the pace for the rest of these. That's gonna be hard for this one though because the second book I finished in January was Lillian Boxfish Takes a Walk by Kathleen Rooney. And oh boy, do I have a lot of things to say. I read the first chapter of this book when I did the try a chapter tag in November. I will link that up there if you wanna check that out. I was so excited after doing that. I was so, so keen to get to the book. For me, reading something only two months after I set out to do so is like pretty soon, so you can tell I was excited. This is a stream of consciousness style, walk down memory lane type book that switches between 84 year old Lillian walking around New York City on New Year's Eve 1984, so it's almost 1985, and she's just like out for a walk, running into people, talking to people, doing old lady stuff, and then every alternating chapter is then her reminiscing about some time in her past, sort of linearly, but not strictly linearly. So we're getting her life story in the same time as we're getting her experiences on this one evening. Initially, I was so into this. I loved Lillian. I loved reading a book where an 84 year old woman is the protagonist, especially when she's super into, you know, staying in her own apartment in the city instead of moving out to her son's house in the suburbs and wants to stay the person she has always been, not just be an old lady. And I was like, hey, she seems so cool. She seems great. I'm really excited to read about her. Unfortunately, I rapidly became annoyed with her character and it was sort of downhill from there. My dislike actually started with the chapters where she's reminiscing about her youth. I found her younger self insufferable, but also I got the impression that I was supposed to like and relate to her character. The early chapters are set in sort of the 1920s and early 1930s when she's just moved to New York City to pursue a career. She's at one point the highest paid woman in advertising in the country, maybe the world, I don't know. Basically she's like, hey, I'm modern, I'm cool, I'm charming. We weren't all stuffy and boring in the 1920s, whatever. And it felt like I was supposed to be relating to this, you know, go-getter career woman pushing against the bounds of society, but she was just a mean girl character? At least that's how it seemed to me. It very much felt that in order to build up Lillian, everyone else and all of their choices had to be put down. I don't know if it's just my reading of this character, I don't know if it's some internalized misogyny in me that's judging her on her actions unfairly. I don't know, maybe this was the intention of the book and she was supposed to be presented this way. It just didn't really work for me. That wasn't helped by the fact that the other half of the story is her going for this very long walk around New York City and sort of, you know, going from one moment of heartwarming human connection to another type thing as she runs into random strangers and has insightful, deep conversations with all of them. But it just felt so forced. There were so many of these encounters in this book and every one of them felt just too artificially designed to inform on her story. It didn't feel like any of the people she ran into were actually real characters who were having their own story that you could have looked in on. It just felt very much like they all existed to serve her story, which like, I know it's a story about her, but it felt like she was the only player character wandering around in a world of NPCs. And it just felt strange. Not to pile the hate on, but at least half of these random encounters type conversations seemed designed to let Lillian tell both the person she was talking to and the reader how progressive she was. A book about someone who was progressive, you know, an old woman who was progressive in the 80s, like that should be interesting. But I think because all we get is her saying things, we never actually see her doing anything really. And it just didn't work. Nothing annoys me more than when a character who feels like a cardboard cutout really aggressively and sort of goes, you're probably judging me for X. You probably think I'm a terrible person for X. Or it's like being gay or being an unmarried mother or something like that. And then Lillian gets to come in and go like, oh no, actually I wasn't judging you. I'm perfectly fine with that. It just really bugged me. Basically, this book just didn't work for me. I don't know why. Maybe I didn't get it. Maybe I was reading it totally wrong. Maybe the author had intended something totally different. Maybe I just can't appreciate this style. I don't know. I just didn't like it, but at the same time I couldn't stop reading it. I didn't love it, but at the same time I didn't want to DNF it. I wanted to know where it was going to finish and how it was going to end and stuff. There are a couple trigger warnings for this book, but I'm going to start putting those in the description, so check that out down below if you would like 
like to know any trigger warnings. The third book I finished this month was an audiobook, and that was The Faithful Executioner by Joel Harrington. This book is a look into executions and how they were used within the German legal system in the 16th century, but all presented through the lens of Franz Schmidt, who was an executioner in Nuremberg, who happened to keep a journal or like logbook of all the executions he did throughout his more than 40 year career. So we have way more information on him and his thoughts than we do for virtually any other executioners, I think. I read this book as a buddy read with Lana and Tara. Make sure you check those channels out, they'll be linked down below. They make really great videos and we had such a fun discussion about this book. The Faithful Executioner had me hooked from the first chapter. I absolutely adore history nonfiction that starts the first chapter by really setting the stage and making you feel like you're there and describing everything that's going on and what's happening and what it sounds like. It was so great and I was so hooked. I thought this book did a great job of placing the executioners within their society and within the social structure of their time and explaining what their role was exactly, while also really clearly explaining how that was not a fixed role throughout all of history. In general, I thought this book was great at being very clear that it was talking about a specific period of history in Germany, not sort of trying to address executioners throughout all of history and all of Europe. On the more personal to friends side, I thought Harrington did a really good job of being very, very clear at delineating what can we infer about Franz's view of the world and his thoughts and his opinions from the documents that he left versus what can we not know. It gives us this sort of very strange image of a person who you feel like you see so clearly and yet also, there's relatively little that we actually know about him. The only part of this book that I didn't love was the section in the middle where it's talking about how friends viewed various crimes and what the relative severities of different things were. I found that section leaned a bit too much into just listing names and crimes and dates and not having enough discussion and analysis of what was being said, but other than that, this was great. I'm seeing more and more that this genre where a specific person or a small group of people is used as a window into a certain specific time or context or experience is a type of nonfiction history writing I really enjoy, so if you've got any similar recs, please let me know down below. But getting back to my TBR for the month though, I also read Milk Blood Heat yes, that is the title, by Dantiel Moniz. This is a debut short story collection, which I read for the debut novel prompt. I figure a short story collection is an acceptable substitute. This actually was just released this week on February 2nd, and I read it as an e-arc from NetGalley. These stories are about a variety of topics relating to womanhood and race and sexuality, and are just so exquisitely written. They're incredible. Moniz writes exactly the type of short stories that I like to read, which are beautiful, amazingly written deep dives into a character or an experience at a particular moment, and she just does it so well. I really also enjoyed how Moniz played with timing in this collection. A lot of the story, it sounds like a strange thing to say about short stories maybe, but where you start or finish a short story can have a really big impact, I think, on how the reader experiences it, and I thought that was done super well in this collection. I view this as a positive, some people might view it as a negative. This collection feels exactly like eating a bar of like super dark chocolate, you know, the 90-95% stuff where it's so dark it almost doesn't taste like chocolate, you eat one square and you're like, wow, that was just so rich and I can't eat anymore and I'm gonna keep eating it tomorrow. Maybe some of you experience that with other kinds of chocolate. I'm a little picky who eats all of the chocolate usually, but these stories were very much like that. They were amazing and raw and intense and vivid, but you only wanted one or two, and then I wanted to sort of put it down and come back tomorrow. I couldn't just sit down and read through this entire book. It would have been way too much. This book does have a lot of potentially triggering content though, so I'm gonna leave a whole list of trigger warnings down below. On the back of that short story collection, which was so incredible, I read another that was not incredible. That was Poirot Investigates by Agatha Christie. This is a collection of I think 14 early Poirot short stories that I think were initially published elsewhere like in magazines or something and then collected together in this volume. I have to say I think I like the Poirot short stories even less than I like the novels. I found that it was a bit 
Someone explains the problem, Poirot does three things and then it's explained. There wasn't any time for the reader to even possibly figure out what he was thinking. Maybe that's just me. Maybe I'm just angry because I can't figure out these stories at all. But I don't think that's the case because I don't usually guess murder mysteries and I enjoy them. So who knows? These also seem to rely far more on racist or sexist stereotypes than I feel like her later stuff that I read did. Not that she ever got super progressive or anything, but I feel like these ones are much more explicitly like, oh, okay, yep. That was the 1920s, all right, than some of her later stuff, which I guess makes sense, but I don't know. Why do I keep reading Poirot when I never seem to enjoy him? And yet, I keep picking them up. I have heard, however, that The Murder of Roger Ackroyd, which is the next one I will read, is really good, and a lot of people say it's their favorite Agatha Christie, so I'm hoping that maybe that one will be a bit better. Maybe it'll start on a bit of an upward climb. The second audiobook that I listened to in January was Persuasion by Jane Austen. This was another one of the books from my Bookworms New Year Readathon TBR, and it is about 27-year-old Anne Elliot, who is is in Austin Times, a spinster. Eight years ago, she broke off an engagement to a man who she loved very much on the advice of a friend and has spent the remaining time sort of just racked with regret. And then this story unrolls when he comes back into her life, sort of by chance. I chose this book to read honestly purely because Emrita of Emrita by the Book was organizing a group read and I trust her judgment 100% and also I have terrible FOMO so I was like, well, I want to pick up another Austin. I loved Emma. I'll read this one. And wow, I am so glad that this is the one Emrita chose. I loved it. At this point, I don't even know which one I liked more, Emma or Persuasion. I just, I love them both and I don't know how the remaining four Austin novels are possibly going to compete and maybe I've already read the best ones for me. One of the things I didn't expect to appreciate so much is that I had no idea how this story ended. I mean, I had a rough guess, but honestly it could have had a very different ending and I wouldn't have been totally surprised. And that was really cool. The only other Austin I've read, as I said, was Emma, and I knew exactly how that one ended. So going through, you could see it building towards that ending. Whereas with this one, I had a much more like, oh my goodness, I'm so, what's gonna happen? Type feeling. Despite the fact that this one might seem kind of sad or wistful or full of regret, it was also a total delight to read. And I was so invested in the character's outcomes, not just Anne's outcome, but like so many of the surrounding characters, I was so invested in them as well. I don't want to say too much about the ending, because I enjoyed reading it unspoiled and I don't want to ruin that for anyone else even if it has been out for know, 200 plus years now but I thought it was a perfect ending. I see how the ending could have gone somewhere else but for this book I was so so happy with how she decided to end it and I was just like yes I'm so happy. The second last book I read in January was Rue Sainte Famille by Charlotte Hussey. This is a poetry collection about I'm not totally sure, to be totally honest. The writing in this was really lovely, it was pretty, it was full of imagery and very evocative and pleasant to read, but I didn't feel like I really connected to these poems at all or really knew what they were about. I'm not great at reading poetry, I'm even worse at reviewing it, so I won't do this book any more injustice. However, I doubt that I'm ruining anyone's fave right now because this book I realized when I went to enter it on Goodreads, and then the story graph as well because I'm using both these days, wasn't even searchable by ISBN. Like it has an ISBN, but it wasn't in the database, so I had to manually enter it because apparently no one in the history of Goodreads has ever read and tried to log this book. That was kind of cool. Never entered a book on Goodreads before. And the last book of January was The Age of Wonder by Richard Holmes. I read this for a book I meant to read in 2020 prompt, I think. It is a look at the science and scientists of the Romantic period in the late 1700s to early 1800s, mostly focused on scientists working in England. This is a pretty chunky book, but it was really well divided up. The chapters are long. Most of them took me between an hour and or two to read, but each chapter follows a specific scientist or scientific discovery. Within each chapter, there's sort of its own mini story arc where you're following that along while that's also adding to the overall narrative about what was happening. I might be a bit of a broken record for saying this, but I feel like the writing in this was 
was very narrative feeling. I really got caught up in each story and felt like I was feeling the atmosphere and feeling what was going on. And even though most of the science in this book has either been disproven or has been like a scientific constant for centuries before my birth, I felt like I was excited about each discovery. And I think that's pretty cool. For purely personal focus related reasons, I found this book kind of hard to read at times and it was a bit of a struggle. But then there were other sections where I sat down for like an hour and just got so sucked in. So I think it was mostly a me problem, not the book problem. And I'm really glad to have read it after putting it on so many TBRs. It was a really good book. It was really interesting. All right, guys, those were the books I read in January. I think it's eight in total. I did read everything on my Bookworms New Year's readathon TBR, so that was good. I had a couple others in there as well. I don't know if it was a good start to my reading year or not. I had some books that were really good, but then others were not great, so we'll see. Hopefully February will be even better. I've now been filming this for like an hour. Hopefully most of that is me sitting here going, I can't speak, what are words? And I'll cut all of that out for you, but hopefully this isn't too long. If you've read any of these, please let me know down below. What did you read in January? I hope it was amazing. As always, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you would like to see more of my videos, please hit subscribe and thank you for watching.